joy to be here, here for the first time. I'm here for the first time. So uh, that's great. May, hopefully not the last time. <laughs> you only know how good you preached when they ask you back. Right? So um, praise God. We want to just share with you some exciting things that have been happening uh, in Thailand. Uh, and uh, as you can see, I'm not typically Thai. Uh, I'm actually from Wolverhampton in England. And uh, my wife and I uh, met in Austria, and God called us to Asia. Uh, and uh, during COVID lockdown, he spoke very clearly to us and said, I want you to come and light fires in Europe. So we're on a 33-day tour of Europe, and this is our last Sunday. We go back to Thailand on Tuesday uh, having been in Germany and in England and now in Ireland. Uh, so we kept the best till last, right? Yeah. Amen. So praise God. Everything I share with you today has as its foundation the most powerful union that God designed. And I want to explain to you what that is, but I'll need someone to help me to do that. So I'm going to ask my wife, Margaret, to come. Now, she's the real pastor of the church. If anyone needs help, they ring her, not me. If, if they ring me, they will get a two-minute prayer and power. Uh, and if they ring Margaret, they get a cup of tea and sit down, and she talks them through things, and then she prays with them and gives them the power as well, So she's the real pastor, but I want to tell you about the most powerful union in the world, and it's this, husband and wife, husband and wife, right, empowered in the manifest presence of Jesus, right, when God created heaven and earth, he said it was good. Then he made the sky and the sea, and he said it was good. Then he made the birds and the, and the animals, and he said it was good. And then he made man, and he said it wasn't good. Right? So he took a rib from man and made a woman, and he said it was very good. <laughs> right? And so we see God ordain man and wife to be together in his presence. He would walk daily with them. And the devil came and split that union apart through sin. Why would the devil do that? Because the devil recognized that man and wife together in the presence of God, was the most powerful force in the universe. So everything I share with you today is because we have discovered that we partner together with each other and we partner together with God. And then, as we do His will together, all things become possible. So if you have seat belts, it's time to fasten them because you're going on a ride of absolute amazing things, right? Because what I want to talk about today, thank you, sweetheart. My best friend, I love her more today than I did when we first married 41 years ago. And um, she is absolutely awesome. And without her, I wouldn't be able to share what I'm sharing today. So I thought it was great this morning when we had family of the week. Wow. Right? Because this is what I'm talking about. Families are powerful. Amen. Amen. And we had prayer for people. That is fantastic. But I want you to start to think about things in a slightly different way. Right? How many people like miracles? Anybody? 
Anybody want to see miracles in your life? Praise God. You know, before you can have a miracle, you need a problem. Because a miracle is God solving a problem that we can't solve. Correct? So all the people who had problems this morning, I want you to start to think, hang on, problems are now opportunities for God to do a miracle. Hallelujah. And that's the way I see problems. Without problems, we don't get miracles. So I embrace problems because they're a means to an end to see God glorified. So I don't know, if, have we got the PowerPoint? Yep, there it is. So this is what I want to talk about today. The anointing for extraordinary miracles. Not just any old miracle, extraordinary miracles. Are you up for that? Amen. Yeah? Praise God, so am I. So, if we read um, this next text that we got up, it's not a text from the Bible, but it's the truth. Transformation begins, whether it's in me or in my family or in the community, it begins when ordinary people realize that they can do extraordinary deeds. Anybody here ordinary? Right, come on, you've got to be better than me because I'm from Wolverhampton. Right? I qualify to do the extraordinary because my dad was a bricklayer and my mum worked in a sausage factory. I'm qualified to be ordinary. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? I'm an ordinary guy. And so, because I'm ordinary, I can do extraordinary things because I'm empowered by Jesus. When I come into alignment with his plan and his purpose for my life, and I ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Every morning I put my hand in the air, I take hold of his hand, and I say, today I'm partnering with Jesus. What are we doing? And during the day, opportunities arise for God to do the miraculous and for his name to be glorified and for him to build his church. Hallelujah. As a pastor, I'm so relieved that I don't have to build the church. And uh, the PowerPoint's running faster than I'm speaking. Praise God. Hallelujah. Or are you show me what's on next on that screen. My word, technology is far in advance of my, I don't even need this then, so I'll turn that off. Hallelujah. So anyway, let me give you an example. I mean, let's think of a problem. Let's go for a big one. What about a tsunami? That was a big problem, right? How many, God taught me through the tsunami that problems are opportunities. So six days into after the tsunami happened on the 24th of December, sorry, 26th of December, uh, 2004, six days after that, we discover a group of people who have been made homeless. Their village was completely destroyed by the wave. Nothing left. In fact, where they used to live was now a sandbank. They lived on a, on a small island, and the island was just all the vegetation, all the animals, everything, all the houses and buildings were just completely swept away so that all that was left was sand. So if you think you've got a problem, try putting yourself in that situation where everything you own, everything you aspire to, the groups of people on that island worship the sea, goddess, and they've even been betrayed by their goddess. Everything's been destroyed. And lots of people have died, obviously. But these were the survivors. They're on the next slide. And we went to visit them. And we gave them some food. And we stayed with them for a couple of hours. And at the end, I said to them, I'll come back again tomorrow with more supplies. 
And they said, really? I said, yes. And they looked, they looked at me as though they didn't believe what I was saying. What we didn't know was that these people weren't even accepted in Thai society. They had no ID cards. They were the lowest of the low. They weren't treated right, and they weren't being given help. So we were the only ones that had done that. So when I went back the next day, I could hear them all saying, he came back. So we ministered to them again. We bought them some tents to live in. We bought them different things, clothes. And then I said to them, we'll be back again tomorrow. And they said, really? And this went on day after day for six days. And they had a, a, a campfire meeting one night. And they said, if he comes back again tomorrow, we'll ask him why. To this point, I haven't even spoken about Jesus. I've been ministering to them without mentioning Jesus. And our team came back and they said, he's back, he's back again. Why do you keep coming back? And I said, because there is a God in heaven. His name is Jesus. And I'm his servant. And I'm here because he loves you. And so I love you too. And on that day, the 6th of January, 2005, the whole village got saved. Wow. I'm thinking, hang on a minute. There's more people getting saved today than we've had in our church after 16 years. What's going on? And, I got, and, and people from my denomination were saying, oh, that can't be right. Maybe it's just the leaders who've got saved and everyone else is following them. The whole village can't get saved. And I'm saying, no, no, the whole village got saved. Everyone believes in Jesus now. And I'll prove it. Because this is the testimony. They're fishermen. And they said, what we really want is to go back to sea to fish again. We want, now we've got faith in Jesus. We know Jesus will keep us safe. We want to get back fishing, but our fishing boats were destroyed. We need wood to build boats. So that night we prayed together. And I was in a tent sleeping there. And about three o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black and I heard this commotion. So I, I opened the tent and I look outside and all the people are dancing around the tent. And they're saying, look, God made it rain wood. And I'm stood in the midst and wood is falling out of the sky slowly, coming down. And when it came dawn, we saw there were six piles of wood, seven piles of wood. And this, each of these seven piles of wood was a construction kit to make a boat. So we go to the next slide. There they are. And you can see in the background one of the piles of wood. And they all fit together to make boats. These boats take about six months to build. And in three days they had seven boats. And they were fishing again. They were the first group of people to go out fishing. The ties that have been given wood from the government, it took them six months before they could, they could uh, fish. But these guys were fishing three days after. Why? Why not? Right? Why not? Because that's how good our God is. Right? Now, the only way I can tell you this story is because I was there. Right? I wouldn't dare tell this story if I hadn't seen it. Because it's just off the charts. It's an extraordinary miracle. Anybody here seen it rain wood? Just me then. Right? Incredible. But there's more. There's more. God is incredible. Right? What he does is just amazing. Hallelujah. So if we go to the next slide... Right? Acts 19, 11 and 12. How is what I've just described any more amazing or out there than this? God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out. Isn't that extraordinary? 
Have you ever done that? Why not? Why not? Right? What's the modern day equivalent? Maybe send in a text message. Pray over it first. I mean, th this is the most common activity known to people under the age of 25. Right? This business. I can't do it. My thumbs won't keep up. Right? But people are texting all the time. Everywhere you look, people are texting. It's probably some of you doing it now. There's a crazy guy at church today. Right? But God is amazing. Right? Look, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. And there are some people here that you're disappointed because your life was going along according to your plan. And all of a sudden, something happened and it just, it's not possible anymore. You cannot fulfill the plan that God wanted you, that you felt God had for you. you felt it's, it's all fallen apart. I can't do it anymore. Listen, the reason why that has happened is so that God can give you a better plan. Because God always has the best for you. And all you've got to do is ask him. Ask and you shall receive. We heard that today from Family of the Week. Right? Ask and you shall receive. You know, Jesus said that in a different way. Just to pull, bring the point home, he said, you receive not because you ask not. God loves you so much that he wants to bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. So, I went to see the governor of Phuket. We had a lot of people coming into Thailand after the tsunami, uh, the United Nations, all the aid agencies that were pouring in and they just wanted to do their own thing. And they basically said to the Thai government, we know what we're doing, stand back, we'll sort it out. That was their idea. But this is a sovereign nation. No one was going to the Thai government and saying, what would you like us to do? So I went. At that time, we had a church of 43 people after 16 years. So, you know, I'm going with authority and power and, right? I'm stood there and I'm thinking, how do I talk to the governor? So I said to him, I represent an organization that is the biggest organization in the world. The church. Right? I'm coming to represent the biggest organization in the world. So he says, oh, that's great. What's it called? So I said, the church. So he said, oh, I haven't really heard too much about that. But come in and we'll talk. And I said something to him that made him cry. Right? I don't know how many of you have ever made the governor of a province cry. But I have. Right? And I said to him, I'm here to help. What would you like me to do? I'm offering my services to you. How can I help you? And you know, Dublin is full of people that need help. And if we go to our neighbours and we say to them, how can we help you? That is a powerful expression of church in community because church is more than just coming together on Sunday and whenever else you have a meeting church is 24 7 being the church in the community so how can you help your neighbor so he said to me well actually there's something that you can do I'm going to authorize you to go to a place where there used to be a school but it was destroyed and most of the children, 60% of the children, were orphaned in the tsunami. But only three children died from the school. And there are 347 surviving children. Most of them don't have parents anymore. It says, will you go there? So you go to the next slide. 
And this, that's all that rubble there in the background, that's what's left of the school. Where I'm standing is where the school was, and it's just a beach, there's nothing there. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see me, and you see it in the background, that's where the school was. Nothing there, it's gone, completely gone. And um, that's me, a bit younger, black hair. Um, and that's what you look like when you haven't slept for six days. Right? But my dad was a bricklayer and he had plans. And he, taught, he taught me as a kid how to draw plans. So I started off when I left university, I went into teaching. So I was a school teacher. So I know about schools and I know about drawing plans. So I drew a plan of a school. And I went to the local authority and said, I want to rebuild the school. That wasn't a good idea. God told me, rebuild the school. As I stood on that beach, he told me, and I got, I got 50 reasons why I shouldn't do it. I said, I've never built a school before. God said, rebuild the school. And I said, but, but I've only got 43 people in church and we've got no money. He said, rebuild the school. And I gave him but after but after but. And when I'd run out of buts, I just said the most powerful words in the English language. Two words. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Doing God's will is the most important thing you could ever do. Even though you don't know how it's going to work out. But you see, I'm in partnership with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so God says, give me what you have in your hands, whatever you've got in your hands. One day, Jesus was preaching to 5,000 men plus all the women and children. And then he said to the disciples, because they told him they're hungry, he said, you feed them. And said, what have we got? We haven't got anything. We haven't got any food. There's this, this little boy and he's got two fish and five loaves. So the little boy gave them to Jesus. And you know the story. 5,000 people were fed. But it, it started when one little boy gave Jesus what he had in his hands. So let me challenge you today. What have you got in your hands? It might not be much. But give that to Jesus and he will multiply it. Amen. So what I had in my hands was I drew this plan and I submitted it to the government and they started to laugh at me. And they said, how much money have you got? I said, I haven't got any money. And they laughed even more. And they said, well, you're not going to get to build the school if you haven't got a bribe. We want some money. And actually, some very well-known multinational companies wanted to rebuild the school because they wanted their name on it. But I submitted my plan and I trusted Jesus. And I said to the Lord, I've done all I can and I, I just felt God in my spirit say, that's okay, son, it's my turn. Hallelujah. You know, when you partner with God, God likes to have a go too. Isn't that great? So the next thing I knew, two weeks went by, didn't hear anything, but then I went to the next slide. I got a phone call and they said to me, the king of Thailand would like to meet you. I said, what? The king of Thailand wants to meet me? That's crazy. How does he know who I am? I passed the 43 people 1,000 kilometers away from Bangkok. What does the, how does the king even know me? He said, he's seen your plan to build a school and he likes it. So it's got nothing to do with bribery. It's got nothing to do with government. It's got everything to do with the fact that the king of Thailand has seen my plan. And the king likes it. So he wants me to go to the palace and meet him. So there I am meeting the king of Thailand and he's commissioning me to build the school. Wow. 
I didn't see that coming. And I could hear God chuckling in heaven, saying, yeah, you partner with me, things happen. And do you think I'd be happy then? I, I was worse. Things had just got worse because I've still got no money. I've still got 43 people. None of us know how to actually build a school. I know how to teach in one, but I know how to build it. Right? And now, not only does Jesus want me to build it, but the King of Thailand wants me to build it. Right? And I'm thinking, God, I've gone from, from out of the frying pan into the fire. What do I do? And God says, hang on, son. It's still my turn. Right? God is good. The, the king said to me, I've got a, my own construction company, so don't worry. When you get back to Phuket on Monday, go to the beach and you will see my construction company. They'll be there. And that's the next slide. And, it, and there's one of the, the pieces of equipment they had. And it was the Royal Thai Army. I wasn't allowed to take photographs. But there were 2,000 soldiers stood on the beach with a general. And when I walked in, they said, Pastor Brian, reporting for duty, sir. <laughs> so I, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how to do all of that stuff. But I'm thinking, okay, now I'm, even, I'm, I'm in a worse mess. But then I remember what my father taught me. The first thing is you dig out the foundations. So I said, okay, guys, dig. Right? And I think, where are we going to get the stuff from? We, we need a million dollars, US dollars worth of, a, of material to build this school. I've got nothing. Where's it coming from? And just as I said that, someone tapped me on the shoulder. So I go to the next slide. And this woman tapped me on the shoulder. She says, hello, I'm from the BBC. Can we do an interview? I said, can I ask for money? She said, Yes. So I did an interview on BBC, went out on the BBC News. And I asked for money to build a school. And schools all over England started to say, this is the project we want to get involved in. So kids all over England were raising money for this school. But that wasn't the end of it. When she'd finished, I got another tap on the shoulder. I turned around and she says, hi, I'm from CNN. And the same thing. And then the New York Times. And then the, the, the Times in London. And every 52 different nations. News media. I did 200 interviews that afternoon. And in two weeks, I had the million dollars. Come on. Is God good? So let's go to the next slide. We built that. Forty-three people in a church in Thailand, in the middle of nowhere, we built that with God. Partnership with God. I look there and that's the football field. I know you're all rugby fanatics, but you lost yesterday, so we better focus on football. Right? So we need a football pitch. So I said, God, we need a football pitch. That's terrible. It's sand. And so God says, you know, you're still, I'm, I'm still with you, son. You know, call the best people you can. So I rang the Premier League in England. <laughs> Next slide. David Moyes. You know him? Yeah. Right? At that time, he was manager of Everton. We had Manchester City. And we had Bolton Wanderers. Three full teams with all their directors, plus the... Uh, Richard Scudamore, who was the chairman of the English Premier League, all flew out to that school. All they did was ask, why? Why not? Right? And they came out. And you can see one of the England teams at the back, I, I know, Mick Mills, he's at the, sort of at the back there. And they came out. And we have the only... English Premier League standard soccer field at that school in Thailand, in Asia. The only one in Asia. Isn't that incredible? Why? Why not? 
The week after this happened was Children's Day in Thailand. And you remember we said that there were 60% of them orphaned. So there were 347 kids at the school. So I thought we need to do something just to give them hope. Let's bless them on Children's Day. So we thought, let's give them a party. Let's get some good, healthy food. So I went to McDonald's. <laughs> and I thought, every kid has a friend. So let's double 347. And, and I'll tell you what, we'll add it up to a round number. Let's ask for seven. So I went in, not kidding you, I went up to the counter in McDonald's. I said, 700 Happy Meals, please. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, when, when the person behind the counter picked themselves up off the floor I said I don't want it today I want it on children's day I'll give you a advance notice but I want 700 and God bless McDonald's they gave us the, the seven we didn't have to pay for them they gave us the 700 happy meals and then we thought we need to give them a present so we went around uh, buying stuff, you know, what would kids love? Okay, toothpaste, toothbrush, uh, you know, different stuff like, no, we bought them toys as well, right? So we made packages that ended up being taller than the kids, right? So we got these big packages packed full of stuff, 700 presents. So the next slide, we turn up to the school and there's a thousand kids, right? Now, when you buy 700 presents and there's 1,000 kids, you've got 700 Happy Meals and there's 1,000 kids, how many know that's a problem? So my church staff turned to me and they said, what are you going to do now? Because let me tell you a secret, if anything goes wrong, it's always the pastor's fault. Right? Yeah? They're nodding. Right? Listen, you folks, they're nodding. It's always their fault. Right? It's my fault. So you know what I did? I said, we're going to ask the Lord to bless the food and bless the presence. So we just said, Lord, you see all these kids here. You know, they've lost hope. We want to give them hope. So we bless this food. Every single child, all 1,000, got a happy meal. Every single one. Two fish, five loaves, Big Mac, fries, exactly the same. No difference. Why? Because God hasn't changed. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. This is the God who we come to worship today. This is the God that you take home with you so that 24-7, you are the church. One of the things we teach our congregation is, you don't come to church. This building isn't the church. You're the church. Right? Will you come to church to be inspired, to worship together, and to be equipped to go into the world to be the church all the time? Amen? And remember, what's the most powerful union? The ecclesia, where two or three are gathered together in my name, and that starts right at home. Our house is an ecclesia. Our neighbours, we had an earthquake. And uh, this is after the tsunami, about six months after the tsunami, there's an earthquake. And we're sat uh, at home and uh, I see someone walk past the window. And I said to Mark, there's somebody in the garden. And when we looked again, all the neighbours were in the garden. And so we went out and we said, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you in our, in our garden? They said, the safest place on earth is wherever you are. Because you have God. Isn't that incredible? All, none of them were Christians. But when there was an earthquake, they come flooding. Why? Because they know we carry the presence of Jesus wherever we are. Fantastic. Anyway, there were 700, there was seven, 700 presents. Every child got a present and there were 200 left over. Wow. This is sounding more and more biblical, isn't it? 
There was, there was excess. 200 presents, so I don't know what we're doing with those presents. Anyway, the next day, we went up country, about 200 kilometers up country, uh, we went to a refugee camp and we met this lady. The lady in the middle is Miss Thailand, or was Miss Thailand at the time. And she's a doctor. And uh, look, guys, the only way you can work with Miss Thailand is if you're married to Miss World. Yeah, come on. I'll get told off for that later. But anyway, she says to me, we've got 200 children here who've got nothing. Hang on a minute. I've got 200 presents. Remember the miracle of feeding the 5,000? There were 12 baskets left over. I want to get to heaven. I want to ask, who, had the, one, who brought the baskets up the mountain? Why would you take 12 baskets up a mountain? Right? Crazy. Right? And what happened? What did you do with it? I bet there was another miracle. Right? We had these 200 presents and we gave them to the kids just as we're doing that. Two cavalcades turn up. The first one, a guy jumps out and says, I'm here. And uh, it was Ricky Martin. Anybody know Ricky Martin, the singer? Anybody? No? Oh, couple. Yeah. Well, the ties were worse. None of them knew who he was. So he announced himself and everyone was saying, so? <laughs> who are you? Right? But then the next car opened and the minister of social welfare got out of the car. And he came over. You recognize Miss Thailand, came over to her and said, who's in charge here? And she said, we are. So all of a sudden, I've got 5,000 refugees. And the minister says, okay, you look after them. Unbelievable. So we ended up with, I'm, a, a, I'm from Wolverhampton. I support Wolverhampton Wanderers, right? We got Matt Doherty, plays for Wolverhampton Wanderers. He's Irish. <laughs> right? And uh, they sent me 3,000 shirts. Football shirts. Wow, fantastic. So, we started to help these people. Next, next slide. And so they, they got all the shirts, right? This is great for me because we're, we're having a meeting. They've got Bibles and, and, and wolf shirts. So I'm, it's like being at a game, right? So I'm teaching them a chorus. Ole, 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 ole. Jesus, Jesus, right? Praise God. Fantastic. It's amazing. So... I could go on, my time's running out, but there's miracle after miracle after miracle, right? And the point of all this is that if God is in you and you're ordinary like me, God can take your problems and help you to see those problems as opportunities for extraordinary miracles. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Your hearts will listen to this and you'll say, wow, that's fantastic, I can do it. Your head, your brain will say, don't be silly, this is Ireland. Right? Don't be silly, he's not an ordinary guy, he's a super, super pastor. Right? You ask our congregation, they think they know, I'm not a super pastor at all. I like football. Right? I like doing normal stuff with people and just introducing Jesus into every normal situation because that's where Jesus loves to be, with people, in normal situations. He wants to be in your family. He wants to partner with you, to be ecclesia at home, to be ecclesia in the community, to be ecclesia at your workplace. Wow. That is incredible. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You say, I don't have that kind of faith. Well, you know what? That was, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can test and approve God's perfect plan for you. But verse three says, and each one of you has been given a measure of faith. That word measure in Greek has another meaning. It means enough. So when you say, I don't have that faith, that's not true. 
The Bible says you have enough. Enough for what? Not enough to say, God, I want this. That's not how God wants you to pray. God wants you to pray the prayers that he wants you to pray. So the key is to get into alignment with his plan. Know his purpose. Be obedient to him. In order to do that, you have to submit your lives to his plan for you. And when you do that, all things become possible. You know what my favorite verse is, Stefan? Is it Stefan? Yeah. yeah. You know what my favorite verse is? Same as yours, Philippians 4.13. Right? I can do all things through him who strengthens me because I apply myself to do the things that he wants me to do. And then anything can happen. Right. You want to see what happened to the church? Go to the last slide. The last slide, not the next slide, the last slide. There you go. That's our church. The guy in pink is the mayor of the city, mayor of the province, right? He appointed me his advisor on righteousness. Hang on a minute. I'm ministering in the Thai government. I'm English. I've not been voted in. I can't be voted in. Right? But I'm his advisor on righteousness. Why? Because he wants Jesus to fill the, the province of Phuket with his glory. Why? Why not? Why not? Right? Praise God, all things are possible. Do you want me to pass on that which I've received to you? Anybody want this? Anybody want this in their life? Yeah? So if you, do, if you don't, don't stand up, right? Don't stand up because somebody else has stood up and they'll wonder what I'm standing up for. But if you want this, stand to your feet and I will pass on that which I have received, the Apostle Paul said, I pass on to you. Hallelujah. I've told you a fraction of the miracles that God does, right? Whenever I go around the world, they want me to speak on miracles, But the key is not that. The key is empowering you, right? Because it's all about ordinary people being empowered by an extraordinary God. So that which I have received in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pass on to you. If you receive this into your heart, tell your mind to shut up and sit down. Receive this in your heart and let your mind be transformed. That problems are opportunities for miracles. And that God loves you. He loves your family. He loves your community. He loves Dublin. Amen. He wants you to become God's Dublin. He loves Ireland. I saw earlier you got pray for Ireland. Wow. Pray God. God loves Ireland. Amen. North and south. Right. And all this stuff division and all that it's all man-made right let's make it the way God intended amen let's believe so in the name of Jesus receive an anointing for the extraordinary in Jesus name the Lord bless you I'll greet you as a Thai greeting and I'll say go forth and do it you are the church amen, amen.